Good morning. I supposed to work. <laughs> I took this picture just a few days ago at the SETI Institute. SETI stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And at the SETI Institute, they conduct scientific research about life in the universe. What you see in the center, it's the Drake Equation. The Drake Equation calculates the likelihood of life on other planets. Or thinking about it in another way, it calculates the probability of our galactic loneliness. It looks at factors like the average rate of star formation, how many of those stars have planets, how many of those planets could theoretically support life, and so on, to figure out the number of civilizations inside our galaxy with which communication might be possible. I've used the Drake equation many times, and every time I end up with a different result, depending on the generosity of my mood towards the universe. <laughs> <laughs> The Drake Equation and I go a very long way back, back to the times when I started to be curious about the sky. And that curiosity changed my life, and all I wanted to be was an astronomer. <laughs> How can I not love the stars? How can anyone not love the stars? Curious to know what they were. I wanted to know all about them. Years later, I'm standing here, and I'm looking at the stars in very many ways. I see constellations, I see cultures, I see science, and I see the galaxy amazed by amazing telescopes, like the Hubble you've just seen. There are about four billion stars in our galaxy. Now, that's exactly the same number of neurons you can find in four people's brains. And to me, this feels extraordinary. It tells me that we humans have a galactic scale complexity. There is such an amazing universe inside every single one of us. Stars are born, they live, and they die, just like the humans they have created. Inside any star, chemical elements combine together, hydrogen into helium, into carbon, into oxygen, and so on. When these chemical elements are formed, stars give up energy that we see as light, we feel as heat or electromagnetic radiation. Then there is a boundary in that alchemy. And the boundary, it's when we arrive to the chemical element iron. I'm very fascinated about iron. Iron is marking the border between giving and taking. And as iron is made in the heart of a star, it is very heavy. So it takes a lot of energy to make that iron. So all that energy that was previously given to the galaxy, now it's taken away, it's absorbed by the star. And if the star is big enough, when it makes iron, it will explode. And we call that a supernova. In that explosion, every single other chemical element that we have ever heard of is also made. And these are the same chemical elements that, makes, that make humans. They're all made like that in the hearts of the stars. It took me many years to get my head around this, but um, it looks like the science is sound. It convinced me that we're all made of stardust. Stardust makes not only people, but planets too. Life as we know it can only form on them. And what is life? Isn't this such a cool question? I did find what life is, but my own way. I followed my wild rabbit, curious to know all about stars. And I went to the point in my life when people started looking at me as if I were some kind of a freak. And they even suggested that I should get a proper job, stop going outside with the telescopes at night. And circumstances of my life did make me s that, um, so that I got a proper job instead of turning into a professional astronomer, but I could not give up the stars. I can never give up the stars. And so my life was spent being torn between what I wanted to be and what I have become. So I went to study life sciences. 
And that's how I found out everything that I wanted to know about life, except for one thing. How did life occur? What was it, the spell, that brought life out of stardust? Good question. Now, I'm a very lucky person. I got paid at some point in my life to wonder exactly about that. And um, that was when I got a job to put together a Life in the Universe display at the Astronomical Observatory that we were overhauling at the time. And uh, what's even more extraordinary, I did that while life was taking shape inside of me as I was pregnant with my daughter. I felt like it was nerd's heaven. <laughs> what did I learn from that? I learned that truly, we have no idea how life was formed. Nobody can answer that question. And you, don't, you, you know why? Because we do not know yet. We haven't discovered that. How did I feel after doing it? I felt like life is yet the most amazing mystery, and sometimes maybe that's just enough. I also felt grateful that we are alive here on Earth, knowing the odds of being alive to happen. To support life, planets must be located within the Goldilocks zone. That means to be not too close to the sun, not too far away to the sun, so then it's not too cold or not too hot, but just right for the life to exist. Our Earth is a gigantic life support environment. It's got air, water, radiation shielding, but if we are going to go beyond the boundaries of Earth, somewhere even as close as Mars, can we survive there? Mars Desert Research Station is located in the Utah desert in the United States and simulates what it would be like to live on Mars. I only photoshopped the sky to look like Mars, and that's me there in the picture. We go there to do planetary science, that is to look out and learn here on Earth before we look there into the stars to understand what we look for. So when I first went on my first mission to the Mars Desert Research Station, I was cruise officer, first officer, astronomer, horticultural engineer, and I was set up to do and find out exactly that. I went to the desert as the scientist, but what I found out there was beyond my wildest dreams. I found out who I really was, because in that environment, in that place, in Earth, there, you have to be a horticultural engineer, you have to know how to make food, you have to know everything about everything in order to make the station go. And so, in the middle of all those, tasting NASA food and gathering rocks and everything, I learned about myself. And I was there to look out, to gather this scientific information in the most prosaic way, and that made me look in. I discovered my Goldilocks zone, and I embraced the fact that I wanted to know all about the stars, but also there was space in it about life and everything else that makes my earthly passions. So being at MDRS made me feel more alive than anywhere else before. When you're already alive, you can travel from planet to planet, but not all life can develop not all planets can develop life. That is why understanding the conditions in which that is started here on Earth, or maybe Mars, as some people think, it's very important for us to understand what to look for in the galaxy. Now, presuming that life does appear and the planet has an um, environment that is stable, how many of these planets can actually how many of these planets can actually develop intelligent life? What is intelligence anyway? Intelligent or not, the dinosaurs had no way of defending from the asteroids that hit Earth. Humans, on the other hand, in my journey through life, I have seen people starting wars because that was the only thing they knew what to do in the name of Mars, which is the god of war and destruction. And the irony being that Mars is the only planet that, with a little bit of help, might support life. So at the Mars Desert Research Station, I saw how these people from all over the world, no matter the color, the belief system, the religion, everything, they all spoke the language of life. And after all, we all live in space, Earth included. In that alien Mars-like environment, I learned that actually culture, it might be just a set of instructions that our ancestors are sending to us, and that 
when we want to create a new culture, a new civilization that looks into the future, we might have to shed away some of those and create a new culture of new intelligent beings. Because our intelligent way of letting everyone else know in the galaxy that we exist was when we produced the first nuclear explosion, and that was before the TVs. But we also invented the Voyagers. And the Voyager is this amazing spacecraft. It's my favorite spacecraft. It's our ambassadors to heavens. These were launched by NASA in 1977 when they took advantage of this alignment of the planets. The planets literally aligned. And they have this planet, they, they have this system on board called Canopus Star Tracker. And they have one eye on the sun, one eye on Canopus. They triangulate their position. They know exactly where they are in the sky. And that was why I'm also here in the Southern Hemisphere. My journey was because I wanted to see Canopus that is on board these Voyagers. Now, Voyagers are only 17 light hours away from Earth, and they've been driving for 36 years. 36 years, they've barely managed to explore the tiniest sliver of the universe. But what it did, Voyager sent back as proof that life exists. And it's here. As Carl Sagan says, this is the pale blue dot. Carl Sagan had the idea of taking this picture, and he said about it on it, everyone you love, everyone you know, everyone you've ever heard of, every human being who ever lived, who ever was, lived out their lives. The Earth is the only world known so far to harbor life. There is nowhere else, at least in the near future, to where our species could migrate. It has been said that astronomy is a humbling and character-building experience. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than in this distance image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. That's what Carl Sagan said. But going back, all the way back to the stardust that we're made of, five billion years since my atoms were formed, I have never felt insignificant nor daunted when I looked at the stars, but I felt inspired and alive. And so the next time the Cassini spacecraft remakes that pale blue dot picture, I'll step back and wave again at the camera that we send so far away into the space to look for things that we're curious about. And whether I will find out or not whether there is life there in the universe, it's less important for me than the fact that I know now that life is the most beautiful mystery. And I consider myself lucky to be here on Earth alive, looking back at the stars in awe. And every time that I'm looking out to the stars, I'm also looking in to the stars, which have been with me all along. Knowing that I'm made of stardust makes me glow every day. Thank you. <laughs>